One of the most powerful ways Jesus communicated to people was through stories, human stories called parables. Today we're sharing a story with you in that same tradition. This is a true modern day story. However, one that communicates a journey taken by people who have lived out a remarkable saga, Paul and Shirley Egertson. This is at the same time a very spiritual telling of their journey as it relates to the first drama ever to be told, the creation story itself. It's deeply symbolic also as Bishop Eckertson starts at the pulpit, goes out into the world, and eventually comes back to the church with new insights and healing. We share this story so that you know you are not alone on your individual or family's journey. And we offer it with the prayer that you will be inspired to move forward to a deeper understanding and true personal peace. Lutheran's Concerned North America presents Bishop Emeritus Paul W. Egertson, Southwestern California Synod, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. The Holy Gospel is written in St. Luke, the 17th chapter, beginning reading at verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. This story about the healing of ten lepers illustrates beautifully the way Christ brings new creation into our lives even today. I'd like to tell you the story of a healing our family has experienced since learning that one of our children is homosexual. What do you say after someone you love says, I'm gay? That's the question our family faced in 1978 when the oldest of our six sons told his mother and me that he is gay. That's the question Christian church families now face as more and more of our lesbian and gay members muster the courage to publicly share what they have privately known to be true for years. My wife Shirley and I share our family story here, not because it's unique, but because it's a typical account of one way parents respond to the news that a child they love and admire is gay. We offer it with the prayer that it may help other families and our church family as we seek to understand a reality that will not go away. Looking back now, we can see seven days of creative development in the healing that we have experienced. Upon hearing the news our son brought to us, on the first day, we sought to deny it. Admittedly, we knew very little about homosexuality at that time. After all, what was there to know? God created people, male and female, for the purpose of reproducing the human race and provided marriage as the proper setting for it. Sexual activity between people of the same sex was obviously a distortion of nature prohibited by both scripture and common sense. What more does one need to know than that? While we knew very little about homosexuality, we knew a great deal about our son, and he didn't fit the image we had of a homosexual at all. He'd been a delightful child to raise, bright as a whip, multi-talented, self-directed, 
self-disciplined, honest and ethical to a fault, helpful and caring toward others. As a matter of fact, the only strange thing we noticed about him as a child was that he would never lie. <laughs> we thought that was a little weird. Well, he graduated from high school with honors and from California Lutheran University with highest honors. Beyond that, he was a devoutly Christian young man planning to enter the ordained ministry of the Lutheran Church like his grandfather and father before him, not from any pressure to maintain a family tradition, but out of a deep inner sense of call. In other words, he was about as ideal a child as Christian parents could hope for in a world where nobody's perfect. We thought if he thinks he's gay, he must just be going through a phase of some kind, and when the right girl comes along, he'll resolve it. In the meantime, let's all keep our heads and not panic. The fact that he had not been sexually active with another man was a comfort to us and lent support to our denial of the conclusion to which he'd come. But with the passing of time, it became as clear to us as it was to him that this denial could not be maintained. And there was evening and morning, a first day. When we could no longer deny it, on the second day, we sought to explain it. How had such a fine young man become gay? What caused it? Our state of ignorance was such that only two options seemed possible. Either he had chosen a style of life that was contrary to nature and the will of God, or his mother and I, in our parenting, had unknowingly contributed to a distorted development of his sexuality. Since we couldn't convince ourselves that this highly ethical boy had suddenly chosen a deviant way of being, the fault must have been in our inadequacy as parents. Either his mother had emasculated him by smother love, or I had been a weak and or too much absent father. And we explored that explanation for a while. But self-serving as the conclusion was, we could not realistically see where that had been true in our case. So we went in search of other explanations, and it was here that our education began. We learned that there are several theories on the causes of homosexuality, that they stand in conflict with each other, that none of them can be sufficiently established to produce a consensus, and that the only certain truth at this point in time is that nobody really knows. The fact is that across time, nations, classes, races, and cultures, a consistent percentage of people in all populations just are homosexual, and the fault cannot be laid at anyone's feet. We learned that nobody understands what causes heterosexuality either. And there was evening and morning, a second day. When we could neither deny it nor explain it, on the third day, we sought to fix it. There were two options open, divine intervention and psychological therapy. As a devout Christian who knew from childhood that something was different about him, and who suspected from adolescence that this difference was something unacceptable to God. Our son had devoted himself to prayer and trust in the grace and the power of God. Preachers said God loved all people unconditionally and could change persons who came with a broken and a contrite heart. So for years, night after night, in the privacy of his closet, he took his broken and contrite heart to the throne of grace, praying for God to change him. But God did not change him. Did that mean he was so defective that even a gracious God did not love him? What else is a teenage mind to conclude? Since divine intervention did not occur, we pursued psychological therapy only to discover that most psychiatrists and psychologists had long since come to the conclusion 
that homosexuality is not an illness and that no known system of treatment can change it. Homosexual behavior can be changed by conditioning people to be celibate or even to function heterosexually, but the inner affectional orientation of constitutional homosexuals does not change. And that was the issue for us because sexual activity was not the problem. In short, there was no known way to fix it. The best that therapy can do is help gay persons accept the reality of their being before the socially imposed shame of it and the personal pain of it drive them to despair, drink, drugs, or death by suicide, all of which it does regularly to persons in our world. And there was evening and morning a third day. When you can't deny it, explain it, or fix it, the only thing left by the fourth day was to mourn it. And parents have two choices at this point, both of them involving some form of death. On the one hand, you can choose the death of rejection and separation from your child. You can say, if that's the way you are, you're no son of mine. You can cut off relations as though the child never lived or as though the child has died. That's an option many parents have taken and an option congregations regularly take in response to their lesbian and gay members. But quite frankly, that was never even an option for us because we could not believe this son we knew so well was in any sense a perverted person. The other choice is to suffer the death of your own misunderstandings, attitudes, and ignorance. But then you mourn the loss of a nice and tidy view of the world in which everything fits together neatly into boxes of black or white, right or wrong, true or false. What's more, as Christians, you mourn the loss of a few biblical passages that can tell you which is which, so you don't have to take personal responsibility for making a judgment. Along with those losses goes the death of your hopes and dreams of ordinary happiness for your child, particularly as that comes through the joys of marriage, children, and a life approved by family, friends, church, and society. In our son's case, there is also the probable death of any hope for ordination into the ministry to which he has always felt called by God. Unless he is willing to sacrifice for it, all experiences of love expressed through human affection and physical intimacy. During the process of this morning, Shirley and I came to realize how close we were to shifting the focus from our son's problem to our own. The final form of death for parents is to recognize that their pain is secondary to their child's suffering and to take up their role as supporters of the life they brought into the world, a life their child has to live out in the world. When that happened for us, the question became, how is he handling this in terms of his own life faith, health, and happiness. It's his problem, not ours. And he doesn't need us to increase his struggle by making the problem our own and then asking him to resolve it for us. And there was evening and morning a fourth day. When our son came to the place where he could affirm the reality of his sexual orientation as something given, on the fifth day, we were able to open our minds and accept it. On that day, we remembered one version of the serenity prayer that pleads, Lord, give us the serenity to accept what cannot be changed, the courage to change what can be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. For us, that has come to mean the acceptance of something in the being of our Son that neither we nor he at first had chosen, 
something neither he nor we at last can change. More than that, it has come to mean seeking change in those things that can be changed, namely the attitudes toward and understandings of homosexuality that remain dominant in both church and society. For we have come to realize that the biggest problem in being gay is not the gayness, but the reaction of heterosexuals to it. We want to join our voices with those of others who seek the ways of healing and wholeness at this point of pain in our world. As parents, we want to publicly thank the pastors and members of St. Francis Lutheran Church in San Francisco, where our son experienced again the gospel of reconciliation in word and action through which the Holy Spirit has kept him united with Jesus Christ. Our prayer is that every Christian parent of gay and lesbian children can someday be certain that their children will find the same gospel acceptance in any congregation they may enter. There was evening and morning a fifth day. By the sixth day, our healing had progressed to the point where we were able to celebrate it. Is that even possible? It depends on what you think homosexuality is. To what may it rightly be compared? Your answer to that question will finally determine the place you stand. At least four options are offered for your consideration. First, you might say homosexuality is a conscious and defiant rebellion against the laws of God and nature. In that case, it is simply a matter of immoral sexual behavior, like prostitution. If that's true, our proper response is trial and punishment by the state, and the announcement of God's judgment, the offer of grace, and a call to repentance by the church. But is homosexuality rightly compared to prostitution? A second option is to say that homosexuality is an illness in which certain behaviors bring the bondage of addiction that can only be broken by total abstinence. In that case, it's like alcoholism, where the problem is not so much the internal condition, but the external behavior of drinking. If that's true, then celibacy is clearly a sufficient solution to the homosexual problem. But is homosexuality rightly compared to alcoholism? A third option is to say that homosexuality is a tragedy in nature, something neither intended by God nor in harmony with God's will, but something that happens regularly in our world nonetheless. In that case, it is one of the tragic outcomes of the fall, like infertility. That too is an unchangeable condition for which the victim is not responsible but a condition we would never call good. If that's true, then shouldn't we treat homosexuals with the same compassion we grant to others who innocently suffer as victims of a fallen world? Shouldn't we make special rules for them so their lives can be as full as possible within the limits of their handicap? When people have a physical disability and can't walk, we don't conclude that God doesn't want them to move. Rather, we provide wheelchairs as substitute legs and set aside special parking spaces that are legal for them, but illegal for others. When people are infertile, we don't conclude God doesn't want them to be parents. Rather, we arrange adoptions. Then shouldn't we provide gay and lesbian people with a social structure equivalent to marriage that can allow them to experience the personal fulfillment produced by love expressed in approved relationships? But is homosexuality rightly compared to infertility? The final option is to say that homosexuality is a variety in nature, one of those delightful differences that regularly appear in counterpoint to the ordinary norm. In that case, it's like left-handedness, a minority condition in a world where most people are right-handed and a few are ambidextrous, but a natural variation having its own contribution to make to the wholeness of the world. There was a time when society considered left-handedness so deviant it had to be punished or changed. But in trying to force that change, we discovered the same thing we're finding with gay and lesbian people today. Attempts to change them don't succeed, but only cause more serious problems. 
once that became clear in regard to left-handedness, we were freed to discover some positive benefits southpaws offer the world. Professional baseball teams, for example, value them highly. You can't win a championship without some lefties. Is homosexuality rightly compared to left-handedness? If so, we can celebrate it as a gift of God. Since there are no experts who can answer these questions beyond the shadow of doubt, all we can do is digest the best information available from the testimony of gay and lesbian people, the ongoing results of scientific research, and the insights of serious biblical scholarship, praying that the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. In the meantime, we all walk by faith and run with risk. Each of us will place our own bet and bear responsibility for its outcome. As for me and my house, we're putting our money on the celebration line. We'd rather err on the side of helping hurting people than on the side of hurting helpless people. Well, that ends the story of our healing. And today we fall on our knees with the one healed leper who returned to give thanks to God. For the healing we first sought for our son, we have now experienced in ourselves. And on the seventh day, we are at rest. <laughs>